This is Real Estate Rookie episode 360. As economic times have created hardships across the country, knowing how not to be taken advantage of and how to navigate evictions is becoming more and more important. And today we're going to cover how to leverage the right channels to make it happen when you were told you have no power. As always, I'm Ashley Kerr, and he's Tony Robinson, your co-host for the show. And welcome to the Real Estate Rookie Podcast, where every week, twice a week, we bring you the inspiration, motivation, and stories you need to hear to kickstart your investing journey. And today, we don't have a rookie on the show. We've got a pretty seasoned investor, Leika Devtha. And Lake is a great friend of mine and Ashley's, and she recently had a pretty big issue go down at one of her $2 million properties. So we're going to get into how to approach illegal squatters and illegal trespassers and how to make sure you've got the right insurance on your properties you're going through this. I never had a, a dream or ambition of it being a newscaster on Dateline or 2020, but today we have some hard-hitting journalism here as Leica speaks out live for the first time, maybe fifth time, about this incident. So this went viral on her Instagram account. This was on a huge nude station that's local to her area where Leica talks about this ordeal with the squatters. So we have Leica here today with us to get the shocking story, the nitty gritty details as she speaks out for the first time telling us exactly what happened. So Leica, thank you for coming on TMZ and spilling the tea. So let's get started. Squatters. First, what is the difference between a squatter and somebody that's trespassing on your property? Because I want to make that clear before we even dive into the story of this. Wow, guys, thank you so much for having me. I can already tell this is going to be a jam-packed, action-filled episode. I love it. Um, I love you both so much. I just I just hope you're ready for my hard-hitting questions. So I'm ready to bring you everything and spill the beans. But okay, what is a squatter? What is a trespasser? A trespasser is someone that gained illegal access into your property. They broke locks, they broke a window, and that's how they gained access. A squatter could be a tenant that stopped paying rent, um, someone that saw an unlocked door that walked in and ended up living there for a long time. Um, another key difference between a squatter and a trespasser is a squatter has intention to just stay. They have no intentions of moving out. A trespasser could be someone that is in the house for a day, a week, a year, but has intention of moving out. Um, so yeah, that's just some of the basic differences. Um, what I had in my unit was trespassers. They were not uh, previous renters or tenants of mine. So it was crazy. Yeah. Before we even get into more of the story, I just want to highlight some of the facts that we have that you had released on your Instagram account while this was all happening and breaking down. So first of all, property damage of $22,000, over $3,000 in legal fees, $9,000 in loss rent, rent, which potentially could have been up to $30,000 following a full eviction. And then also letters from other tenants asking for a rent discount due to what was going on at the property. That's correct. That's $34,000 right there. That's $34,000 of just like actual hard money, not to mention the the time, the effort, I'm sure the, the stress that came along with that. And like, I think this episode is going to be so important because for a lot of our rookie investors who are listening, I do think that uh, a fear of theirs is getting that nightmare situation where you've got a squatter or a trespasser. And like some people are so afraid of, of, of that happening, they just won't buy real estate at all. So I'm happy to get into kind of how this played out for for you, Leica. So when did this whole ordeal start and, and what was going on in that moment for you? Um, it's kind of bittersweet. I got to actually MC the Bigger Pockets conference last year, which was such a big deal for me. It was just like, you know, one of those things that is, you know, everybody's dream to do. Uh, you're in real estate and you get to host one of the largest real estate conferences in the country. And 
I was about to go on stage. It was the very first night um, and announced to 3,000 people that we were going to kick off this amazing conference for the week. And I was in hair and makeup right before I went on stage. And I got a call from my property manager saying that someone had illegally occupied one of my units back home in Seattle. And it was one of my most expensive properties. It was a $2 million property. And the top unit had views of um, the a beautiful water views, a stunning bridge. And the rent that we were getting from this property was three grand a month. Um, and someone had gone in, changed the locks and moved in. And we're now telling my property manager that they were the legal tenants. Um, and they had signed a lease with someone to go live in this property. And I, I just remember like being on the call with him thinking, okay, I'm about to go announce the largest conference I've ever done in my life and probably will ever do. And here I am getting this devastating news because I don't even know how to deal with this. And then the Seattle tenant laws are so rigid for landlords that I could possibly not even evict them for the next nine to 18 months. So I didn't know how I was going to deal with all that. I didn't know what I was going to make of the situation. I just knew that I had something so amazing in front of me that I wasn't going to like let this bog me down. And so I remember telling my property manager like, hey, look, I'm coming back from the conference in a week. When I get home, I'll deal with this. And so I went on stage. I had the best time. I announced the conference. Um, I had a great week of, you know, all, all amazing things on stage. And then I went home and then I dealt with my squatters. But first, Leika, when you're in that moment and you're thinking it could be up to 18 months until this person is actually out of this property, how much money was that that you would be paying out of pocket every month to cover expenses that were no longer covered by this property? Do you know that number offhand? Yeah, I think almost like 50 grand if you think about it for um, a year and you, you, because you're paying your rental income, your uh, your mortgage, you're paying your taxes, your insurance, your utility bills, like you're still paying for all of that um, because it's it's one unit. That's a scary number, $50,000 to have mm-hmm. to come up with for a year while knowing someone else is enjoying and destroying the comforts of your home. Exactly. And plus, because it was one unit out of a triplex that they had occupied, I still had to pay the, all the utilities for the building. And I still had to pay like all the regular stuff that I pay as a landlord um, because I didn't want to disturb my other tenants. So it was just a double whammy. Like before we keep going, I just want to ask one question quickly. You, you mentioned that, you know, Seattle has super strict uh, landlord laws, maybe favors the tenant a little bit more, very similar to what we see here in California. Knowing that, did it make you hesitant to even hold rentals in that city? And if so, what kind of gave you the confidence to, to press on and be a landlord in such a, a tenant friendly area to begin with? Tony, that is such a good question. And honestly, when I posted a video on my Instagram and it went viral, um, a lot of the comments on that was, Oh, you know, it's your fault for investing in a landlord uh, or a tenant friendly state. It's your fault for owning rentals in Seattle, um, where you know that you, you get no help for, um, for a situation that you put yourself into, right? But here's the actual truth to all of this. The real estate in my market appreciates double every five years. Real estate in my market is my tenants in my market are really good high income earners with um good quality jobs and a great lifestyle my market economics are better than most states in the country um our rental income is better than most states in the country now given all of this yes our landlord laws are not the best But all of these other factors contribute to me continuing to invest in my city and my state. Um, So is this going to deter me from investing again in my state or holding long-term rentals? No, it's not. Because yes, I could have a, I could 
own a, a property in the most landlord friendly state, but if it's not appreciating, I'm not getting good rents and I'm still not getting good tenants, then what's the point? At least this way I'm boots on the ground. I know that this is an appreciating asset. I, even if my cash flow is stalled for the minute, I know that the asset itself is appreciating. Like, I think one thing we need to make clear for this episode too, is that these weren't tenants. So even if tenant landlord laws are strict or not strict. These are not tenants in the property. Anyways, as you clarified for us in the beginning, these are trespassers in your property. So even if you are not in Seattle or California or a strict state, there still could be, you know, a, you could still get into a squatter situation where it's different laws that apply to those types of people. So like, let's get back to the story as to your home from bigger pockets. What is your first step? So, yeah, as soon as I got home from bigger pockets, I got on a call with my property manager who then said to me that he had already tried to go speak with these trespassers and, um, see if, you know, what was their story? What was their backstory? How did they get access into the property? And these trespassers said to him that, Hey, we actually found this property on Craigslist. We message someone on Craigslist and we sign the lease. The reality is that we never post any of our properties um, on Craigslist for rent. So what had actually happened was my tenants had moved out on September 29th and the property went back on the market listed for rent on October 1st. And October 2nd or 3rd, these squatters or trespassers basically had... um potentially signed a lease with someone on Craigslist and enter and then got access, I don't know how, into the unit, had broken the locks, changed it, and then moved in. Um, and the whole story about because my trespassers still say that, you know, they signed a lease. Well, if they signed a lease, they didn't have to break the lock. So obviously their story doesn't hold good, but um, they changed the locks and moved in. And so my property manager was basically talking to them saying, hey, if you actually signed a, a fraudulent lease, like, why don't you sign a lease with us? And then we let you continue to live in the in the property. And they said, nope, we don't know you're the property manager. We have no evidence that you work with the owner. And so my property manager said, okay, do you want to come down with me? We'll go talk to these people and say, okay, um, you know, see if they, they're more forthcoming with you being the owner. So I went there. I had a legal document that said that I owned this property. I had my driver's license so that they could see that I was the legal, indeed the legal owner of the property. So we show up there and I'm like, Hey guys, this is who I am. I'm the owner and I'd love to sign a lease with you. Will you please just sign the lease with me, start paying me rent and I let you live in my property. What I got back from them was just offense after offense. Like, you do not, this is, we don't believe that you are the owner. Those are forged documents. Um, we don't trust that, you know, you have our interest at heart. We, um, we don't have to show you any document that we signed or our lease. Uh, we will only talk to the police. At which point I ended up calling the police. And I was on hold for a long time. And then when an officer finally spoke to me, he said, this is a civil matter, not a criminal offense. And so there's nothing we can do. You're on your own. In that moment, when you get that, like, what is your first instinct as to like, I have to now go through a full eviction? Like, what? how did you control your emotions to actually make a decision as to how to move next? On this. So the other thing that happened in that moment is when I went and knocked on the door and they opened the door, I saw that they had already started doing damage to the property. They had literally ripped out the carpets. All the door jams were falling down. Like as we opened the door, I could just hear bang, 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 like all these things falling off. Um, and so I, in that moment, I was like, oh my God, forget the eviction process. Forget what's going to happen to my other tenants. My building is in jeopardy. Like they could literally like break down the building or light a fire and I'm on my own. I have no help from the law whatsoever. So I'm literally on my own and I've got to 
somehow work this out. And I had no idea how I was going to proceed at that time. I just want to ask one one clarifying question, Leica, because you, you said you went to the police and they said that it wasn't a criminal matter, it was a civil matter. So like breaking into someone's property is is civil, not criminal? Yes. So a couple questions that the police asked me. They said, do they have any weapons? Did they threaten you in any way? Um, are they do you feel like they are a threat to society? Um do you feel like they are doing any kind of illegal activity in and around the property? And because the uh, my answer to all of this is either no or I don't know, they said, well, we can't help you. This is a civil matter. I would think that breaking into someone's house is like <laughs> like something you should be able to call the cops about. But good good to know for us now that if you do run into that issue... Like just tell them, hey, someone broke into my house. I'm worried that they're extremely dangerous and that they're doing a lot of illicit, illegal activity inside the property. Please can get them out. That way the cops have a have a motivation to actually take action. I mean, I think even if you said that, I don't know if they would take action because they're probably like, well, no one's hurt. And so this is still, it's not our problem. It's still a civil matter. What is your attorney saying all of this? Are you using the property manager's attorney? What's kind of happening with your legal advice at this point? So first, my property manager obviously hired his own legal team, um, someone that he uses for evictions all the time. And when I spoke to that attorney, that attorney was very clear that, look, we have very strict guidelines to follow and we're not going to shift. We're not going to move from them. So it is so important to also find an a legal team to kind of have your back. And yes, there are laws that you have to follow, but then you're dealing with a trespasser that that didn't follow the law. And so what is it that you can do where you can go above and beyond while still following the law to actually make some kind of a, a change, right? So the first at attorney said to me, hey, um, it's a six to nine month eviction process. And given how late um, the uh, courts are going to take our case in, we probably will not even be in court till March. And this happened back in October. And so I'm thinking, wow, till March, these guys are just going to continue to live in my property for free. That is not going to happen. And so I ended up finding my own legal team. I ended up talking to some of my friends in the area. And this is where your network truly plays a huge role. Um, one of the people that I spoke to was James Daynard. As you all know, he was my co-host at the conference. And I was talking to him about the situation right before we were going to go on stage on the second or the third day. And I was like, James, what do I do? And he's like, oh, I've dealt with this before. Use these attorneys. So the first thing I did when I went home was I actually called one of the attorneys on James's list, who also happens to be a really good friend of mine from back in the day. And she is who I ended up hiring to take this case down. Of course, James Daynard has the solution to that issue, right? <laughs> <laughs> so once you connect with this new attorney, like, uh, um, I, how much time had passed at that point? Had it, is that like within the same week or are you now months into this journey or how much time had passed? I think about three weeks had passed since the trespassers had uh, taken over my property. And had you had any communication with them and like during those three weeks since that initial conversation? Um, not after that first conversation. The first conversation I went in and like, you know, we had that meeting, so-called meeting. And then after that, I went, you know, and I stalked the property a little bit, but I never saw them or had another conversation with them. Were you able to get any information like on who these people were? Like, are they just complete strangers? Do you have names? Do you have any identifying information about them? No. So that was the challenging thing is we didn't even know their names. Um, we didn't know who to address. Like we were going to put like you can, um, as the landlord, you can give them a notice to vacate. Uh, and we didn't know what names to put on the notice because we didn't know their names. We didn't know who they were, where they came from, nothing. So all we had was their photographs and videos I had taken off them. Um, and we weren't able to identify them at that point. Tony and I are a uh, new investigative journalist. Uh, going forward, 
What is something that you and your attorney did to actually find out who these people are to be able to give them notices? Okay, Ashley, you're going to be so proud of me for doing this. (laughs) So what I did was I actually camped outside the unit one day and I just waited for the mailman. I sat there for, I want to say, three hours and I saw the mail truck pull up um, and it was a USPS truck. And so I stopped the guy because he had mail that he was going to deliver to the unit. I stopped him and I said, stop, I want to I want to see your mail because I am the legal owner of this property. There are scammers in the first unit and they're trying to take over my property, like just stop delivering any mail. And he was like, OK, done. I'm not going to deliver any mail. But also... um, you would have to go down to the USPS post office and basically say that you're the owner and you have to stop the mail. Like you have to legally prove you're the owner and then stop mail. I said, done, I'll do that. And then I said, out of curiosity, can I just see the the mail? The minute I saw it and I took photos of the mail, I couldn't open it because that's not legal, but I took photos of the mail and I got their names on it. And I was then able to pass that mail on to my attorney and then she was able to run a background on the, on these people. That is super, super ninja trick there, huh? <laughs> and all the girls with boyfriends that they want to track down. <laughs> <laughs> how they're going to do it. Came out there, I look for their mail. Who's the new girlfriend's name that's on the mail that's living in my <laughs> boyfriend's house? <laughs> okay, so you have their information by camping out, doing some work. You go and handle things through the post office. Well, I, I'm curious, as far as like utilities, did they actually go and put the utilities in their name? Were you able to actually just shut off the utilities? How did that work? Yeah, so they were not able to put the utilities in their names, but they did get Comcast in their names. And when you have a document like a Comcast with your name on it, suddenly you've established what they call residence in the property. And Comcast is like the internet? Yeah, sorry. Comcast is like your cable and internet. I was so they they get internet in their name, but are you are you then able to shut off like electric and water to that unit or or what are you doing with the other utilities? So typically to shut off utilities, you don't pay your bills for 2 months. If you don't pay your bills for two months, then the utility company flags you and sends you a mail saying, hey, your bill has been paid. And then you can tell them that you want the utility shut off and then they take a month to shut it off. So you still have a, they, the, they have a three month runway till the utilities are shut off. Now you have to also understand the people that squat or trespass, they know these city laws. My squatters actually went to something called the housing justice project in Seattle and spoke to them about Hey, um, if we actually squatted on a property, what is the landlord's recourse? And they heard from a pro bono attorney that you, it takes six to nine months to evict someone in the state, in the city. And they said, Oh, great. We have six to nine months to live here. So someone's actually feeding this information. Right. Yeah. That's, a, that's what I want to pause on really quickly. So you're saying there's some kind of organization out there that is coaching squatters on how to be more efficient <laughs> in taking properties from landlords. Is is that what you're saying? Yeah. So I think that's why this is a much bigger issue than people just squatting in my unit. I think there's like a whole other realm to this is that there's people encouraging this behavior and enabling people to do this. Um, and now you also have to understand that these trespassers and squatters are not doing it from big corporations. They're finding smaller mom and pop landlords like me. And so we don't have the legal means to go after a whole organization like this. That's a much bigger issue. But it is something that we need to tackle. It is something that needs to be brought to light because this is not legal. This is not civil. This is very much criminal. So now that you've got all this information, all these pieces put together, you have your new attorney what advice is your attorney giving you besides just doing an eviction? Um, so this is where having an attorney that has the same mindset as you is so important. Someone that has that same work ethic, that same hustle power, 
right? And so that's what I love about my attorney. Her name's Cynthia Melton. And she runs an all-woman legal team here in Seattle, which is more power to her. Um, and so what she said to me was, look, we're going to have to attack this from many different angles. Like, let's talk to the prosecutor's office. Let's talk to the police department again. Um, let's actually involve the press and the media. So during all of this, I, that, video of, that I posted on Instagram ended up having over 700,000 views. So what the, and the media caught on to it because of that video. So then what my attorney ended up doing was sending this video to the police department and to the prosecutor's office. Now suddenly it got flagged in the police department as, okay, this is a real story that's getting all of this attention. Um, because the media was after it, the media ended up um, shooting a whole docu series on what happened, how these squatters got in, how I was dealing with the situation. They interviewed me, my property manager, my attorneys, and people around the unit. Um, and they started doing their own digging because we had got the names of the trespassers from their mail. We were able to now look up their criminal records and we found that the woman that was squatting at my place was an OnlyFans content creator. She was actually found topless in Seattle a month before. Like a found like in the street topless? <laughs> topless Just like they like found her wandering around? They found her on the streets of Seattle. She was, her name was actually flagged. Um, they hadn't detained her or anything, but they had found her in the streets of Seattle topless only a month prior to what had happened. I mean, th that can happen to anyone. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> who, who hasn't been found yeah, topless by the police? Yeah, right. in Seattle? Sure. Exactly. <laughs> and that, that too in downtown Seattle. Sure. Um, but when the, when the cops found out who she was and they found out what she did, they said, okay, fine. This is definitely a criminal matter. It does seem like she did trespass. She didn't have any legal, um, lease that she signed. And so they said, okay, this is criminal. So one day I get a call from my attorney's office and it was on my son's 11th birthday, November 7th. And, um, the attorney's office said, Hey, the cops are willing to go do a raid and get your, uh, trespasses out of the unit. And that was huge for me. That was like so unbelievable that the cops were actually going to be on my side. Um, they said they went through all of the documentation. They went through um, all of the documents that we sent to them. Um, and they have decided that they're going to go in and actually get these people out. But they need you to accompany them. And so I was like, okay. So I ended up going on a raid, a police raid, my first ever, hopefully was my last. Was like an adrenaline rush? Did you write something off the oh bucket list? Oh my <laughs> God, it was. It was. It was scary. It was. Did, um, did they have you with like a bulletproof vest hopping out the back of the SWAT van and there's like theme music playing? Um, Not a bulletproof vest, but I did, I, I did accompany them to a secret location where we did the whole rundown of what was going to happen, who these people were, and come up with different scenarios. What if one of them, you know, did this, that, and the other, if they had weapons, if they didn't have weapons, like there was a whole situation. Um, and then the police also told me that, look, if there's significant damage to the property that I could have them detained. Uh, but if there was not significant damage and they had just trespassed, then they would still be taken back for questioning, but they wouldn't actually be held uh, or go to jail. So I was like, great, okay, let's go do this. So then this is a really true and sad and funny story all in one. But we ended up going to the property and the property has a front door and a, and a side door. Uh, there were officers in the front door. There were officers in the side. The media was there shooting all of this. And then I was standing kind of to the back, just like watching all this from one street above. And, um, and then they went in, they banged on the door and they said, Seattle police, open the door. <laughs> and the squatters inside. In that same voice? In that same, there was a little bit more like. So then they knocked on the door, they banged on it, they, they used a microphone to like scream in. Um, and then the squatters, this is gonna amaze you, they call 911. And then the cops are like, we are 911, open the door now! It was, oh my god, it was, it was quite the ordeal. And so then finally, they, they just wouldn't open the door. And so they had to take this big like boulder and bang down that door. 
and enter the unit. I'm watching The Wire right now, binge watching it. So these visuals that I am getting from your story, it, The Wire, 2002, that's what I'm getting. Wait, I'm I'm dying at the fact that they called the police on the police. I know. <laughs> they called 911 on the cops. And the cops I are like... I don't even know if that's an option. <laughs> Next time I get pulled over, I'm going to try that. I'm just going to call 911 and say, look, I just, I got a speeding ticket, but I don't know how I feel about this. <laughs> yeah. You can't say speeding ticket, Tony. You got to say someone's pulling me over. I have no idea why. Yeah, I've got an unidentified vehicle uh, behind me right now. <laughs> someone's following me. I mean, are they like dragging them out of the property? They're putting them in the back of the cars and they're just gone? So what they did was they went inside and they handcuffed them. And uh, they actually pinned them to the floor and said, what, what is going on? And at that point, both these trespassers were like, look, we signed a legal lease. We have a right to be here. Here's our Comcast utility bill that says our names on it. Um, and, and then the cops were basically like, no, the homeowner is with us and you are clearly trespassing on her property. You have no right to be here. And so they removed both of them. They put them in the police van and they took them to uh, to the station. Now, for tenant landlord laws, at least in New York, like if a tenant is evicted and they leave their stuff, you have to hold it for X amount of days. In this situation, I mean, there's stuff that's in there. Is it now your stuff to just do whatever with or did you have to give them their stuff back? Yeah. So once we entered the property, that was a whole other situation because it felt like these people had just lived there for years. They had an art station where the woman was painting. They had a whole DJ turntable. And guys, this is the best part. They had a stripper pole in the middle of my living room. Like, I cannot even make this up. Like the one Tony has in the back there? <laughs> <laughs> just like it. That's how I get my car to run before the recordings. But yeah, they they had really moved in. There was like cake and on the... Uh, kitchen floor like there was stuff everywhere um they had she had so much like wardrobe stuff like heels and jackets and bags and they were designer bags and prada jackets and probably sadly all stolen uh they even had two puppies like that was breaking my heart they had these two little puppies in there and um and so when we walked in Thankfully, there was not significant damage to the actual physical condition of the property. And so the cops said, okay, we're going to just take them back for questioning and then release them. Uh, now, this is also scary because once you release such criminals, they're just going to go find someone else to go harass or take over someone else's property. So I don't know how to put an end to this. I don't know, you know, how to make this a bigger deal than what they're making it out to be. But, um, but no, so there are some laws, even squatters and trespassers have laws. Uh, we had to hold their stuff until they could come in and retrieve them. So we did hold it for a couple of days. They came back, they took all their stuff, they took their puppies. And then um, the following week, I had a junk removal company come in and take everything out. Like I didn't want to have to deal with anything. So they came in and took everything out. So looking back on this, Leica, what are some of the lessons learned that you would do going forward to prevent this? Or if it does happen again, you know, you, you would take these action steps and things that you would do different. Yeah, I think, okay. So first is, I know a lot of people would probably say, don't invest in states or cities with unfriendly landlord laws. Again, that is not an option because it's a great place to invest and grow your assets and your real estate portfolio. So I'm going to continue to obviously invest here. Uh, but going forward, I think some of the things that I could do better is have my property managers install ring cameras outside the properties and at, especially when properties are vacant, right? Like, you know, so you're constantly monitoring who's coming and going into the property. I don't think my property manager did a very good job of actually keeping tabs on the property when it was vacant. So I would have them go in and look at the property or drive by it at least a couple of times, um, if not three or four times a week. Tony, I, uh, hold on, like I have a question. Tony, you know, in your Airbnbs, you put that monitor for the noise level. Mm -hmm. Do you think that would yeah. work to like put in vacant houses? Like how low can you set that noise level where like, like there's literally a person talking, it would like alert. Yeah, you actually could. Um, it, 
and it, it has to be like that loud for like a certain threshold. So someone was just like, I don't know, a loud car drove by, it wouldn't go off, but say it was louder than whatever decibel for more than 10 minutes, you could get notified. That'd be a super easy way to kind of monitor your, your vacant units without having someone like watching a camera. That is amazing. What is this device called? So we, there, there's a few of them out there. Uh, we use Minute. M I N U T into a noise monitoring device. You can get a, you can get it on Amazon, but yeah, we have it in all of our larger Airbnbs. That's amazing. Um, yeah, that is something I'm definitely going to tell my Airbnb property manager and also my LTR property manager to start putting into my units. That's awesome. Tony, is this something also you have in your house when you and Sarah go on vacation and leave Sean home alone as a teenager from one of these noise monitors? <laughs> it would, you know, it wouldn't be a bad idea, you know? I'm so sorry, Sean, if you're listening for putting this idea in his head. Well, we just hired a nanny, actually. So we have like nanny cams now in the living oh, room. Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, yeah, he probably couldn't even get in or out too many people if he wanted to. Okay. So like uh, what else um, besides that, as far as like keeping tabs on your vacant unit? Would you do different? I also think that having really good landlord insurance is super helpful because my insurance did cover my loss of rent on this property and also damage to uh, the condition of the property. So new carpet, new baseboards, all of that was paid for by my insurance company. Now they wouldn't pay like I ended up actually spending 25 grand fixing up this unit. They wouldn't pay all of it, but they paid 50% of it. So something's better than nothing. Um, but also you guys, like all of my legal fees that came out of my pocket. That was not something that was covered by insurance and it's never going to be. So these kinds of situations still end up having a financial impact on someone. Um, and if this ended up going to a full eviction and an eight month legal process, imagine all those legal fees that I could be responsible for. A lot of landlords don't go after their squatters or trespassers because ultimately the legal aspect of it and the fees that they end up paying would potentially be more than if they just let someone live in their unit unlawfully. Like a last question for all concerned that they might like target your properties moving forward. And the reason I asked this, we had to call the cops on the same Airbnb guests twice at two different properties. So they booked one of our properties. We had to call the cops to get them out. And then they booked a different property a few months later. I had to call the cops again to get them out. So have you? Are, are you at all concerned that you know now they've seen your face? They know who you are. Like they might just start making making problems at other properties that you own. Actually, on the contrary, I feel like they'll never mess with me again because they messed <laughs> they messed with the wrong girl. <laughs> That's the right way to look at it. But I'll tell you why this happened. Right. Um. So first of all. They occupied the largest unit in my triplex. The reason that, and this is what they said to the cops, the reason that they ended up use, occupying my unit over a bunch of other rentals in the property, in the area was because all of our rental properties are in different LLCs that are either incorporated in Nevada or Delaware. Now that makes us absentee owners, absentee landlords. So if someone's looking at a property to go squat, they're going to go find a property where the landlord is not even in state to have all of these boots on the ground or eyes on the property, right? So this is another reason to invest where you live because I know contrary to popular belief and long distance investing and all of that stuff, there are things like this that can happen to you where it's much better for you to be in person and on, boots on the ground than be away in a different state. So they thought that because our LLC was a Nevada corporation, that we actually weren't in state and it was under a different name, not our own names. They didn't see that we were actually in state. Second, they also went to the housing justice project, which did tell them that it takes nine months to evict someone from this city, uh, from a house. So, you know, all of these things put together made our unit a very targetable, comfortable unit for them to have gone and squatted. So just make sure that, you know, if you own units like this and if you have rental properties that you're making doubly sure that your property is not ending up on Craigslist or um, not ending up in the wrong hands. Well, Leika, thank you so much for coming on Dateline 2020 MSNBC, uh, whatever we're calling our investigative show here, to share your story. Um, and it is sad to think of, you know, that this happens to somebody as you as the investor. It's also, you know, horrible. Somebody's getting kicked out of the 
home that they thought was their home. And maybe this is, you know, there are people out there that really think that the home that they're living in is their home, even if they have no legal right to it. I think sharing stories like this can really help other invest or other investors become aware of like things that can happen and not only things that can happen, but also learning the lessons of how you can prevent it, what you can do if this actually happens to you and take action. And like you had said, one of the powerful tools for you was networking and specifically James Daynard and getting, you know, that referral for um, an attorney, but you were able to get media attention, all these different things because of those connections that you had in that networking and really pushing and sharing your story on social media, another powerful, impactful tool. So if there are any rookies listening that are going through a similar situation or any kind of disaster that you think is happening inside your head, reach out in the Bigger Pockets forums, reach out in the Real Estate Rookie Facebook group, talk to other investors in your area. Uh, like, like I said, you got to think outside the box and sometimes just settling for what an attorney says is not the correct way to go and go and talk to other attorneys who have a different idea of how to take action and can get creative. Just like we all want to get creative in structuring our finance deals, get creative with a lawyer with some kind of legal structure. So thank you guys so much for listening. Thank you, Leica, for coming on to the show today. We really appreciated you giving us the hard, honest truth of what it's like having a squatter in Seattle. And before we wrap up here, I just want to give a quick shout out to someone by the username of jbiddle1. jbiddle left to say five-star review on Apple Podcasts and says, Ashley and Tony bring a fun and motivational dynamic to real estate investing. I enjoy their personal stories, especially when things don't go as planned. They continuously show you, you just need to work through the issues that pop up and not give up. So I think that review speaks perfectly to, to your story, Leica. So uh, if you guys haven't yet, if you're a part of the Ricky audience, take a few minutes, leave us that five-star review on Apple Podcasts. They deserve it. They're so good. Leica, before we leave, I was taking a walk the other day with my son and we have lots of woods by us and a lot of people put up no trespassing. And he was like, what does that mean? And it shows like the homeowner's last name and just like a little blurb about like no hunting, no fishing, no going on this property without my permission. It, is that anything that would ha- like that would work in Seattle? Does that those signs even do anything? The trespassing signs? Yes, that's a great other great question, and that's one thing that I would add to the list of things that I would do going forward at all my properties is put up no trespassing signs. Now, there's another weird law that says that you cannot serve someone a trespass notice to vacate if there's no trespassing signs not installed on your property. So the other thing that I did was I went on Amazon and you can buy these no trespass signs for like three bucks a piece. So I got them shipped to me overnight. I had my contractor go put these up all around the building. And then you can indeed issue a no trespass um um, letter. And once they have that, then that's another way to establish that this is criminal activity, not a civil case. There you guys go. One last little free tidbit from Leica. Thank you so much, Leica. We loved having you on the show and can't wait to have you back on again. And hopefully it's for something uh, more appealing than squatters. More positive. Yes. Thank you guys for having me. Um, and I truly hope my story can be shared and helps one person get their squatters out in a timely manner. If you want to learn more about Leica, her investing journey or her squatter story in Seattle, you can check out the show notes where we will link all of the information and be able to direct you to getting into contact with Leica. You can also find social media handles for Tony and I also in the show notes. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and check us out in the Real Estate Rookie Facebook group. I'm Ashley and he's Tony and we'll see you guys next time. Stay.